Hey everybody. Uh, I recently received in the mail my latest little gadget I've got for my aquarium. That is my Total Dissolve Solids Meter. I had one in the past, but I bought a really, really cheap one, and I never really trusted the numbers. Um, so I finally got a new one. I've been meaning to get around to doing that for a while. But now that I've got it, it is time for us to get back to... Uh, talking about water chemistry and picking up with my layman's lectures videos uh, There's no particular reason we're looking at this tank. We just have to be looking at something while I'm talking So we'll look at this tank for a moment um, So I've got this total dissolved solids meter. I've done some preliminary testing in my water I'm not getting numbers that shock me or really completely puzzle me But I'm not seeing what I was expecting to see either and I am getting a little bit of a uh, uh, confusing numbers not hundred percent sure what I'm looking at with my water at the moment so I am actually waiting for a call back from my water guy I'm gonna see what it costs me to get a sample of my water sent off and I would like to get a uh, complete chemical analysis of my water so I know exactly what I'm dealing with I would like to know what's coming out of my ground and I would like to know what's coming out of my tap um, but I'm getting ahead of myself. That's going to be for as the discussion continues. Uh, there always just seems to be a lot of confusion and misunderstanding about TDS. Uh, even when I talk to professionals about it, and I talk to professional chemists, and we're always, you know, no, 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 that's not what I mean. I'm talking about this, and I'm talking about that. And it gets really confusing, and it, I mean, it, it really does. The, the total dissolved solids your pH, your hardness, and that means your temporary hardness, your permanent hardness, your carbonate hardness, your general hardness. All of these have different meanings and definitions and they all impact each other in their own way. And the number of total dissolved solids in your tank may or may not affect what's going on with all of that stuff. And it just gets into being a really, really jumbled uh, mess. So we're going to have to probably pick away at it. I'm probably going to have to do a series of videos talking about this stuff. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I guess I'm going to get started uh, tonight. Uh, and we're going to just, I guess, start by defining what TDS means. It means total dissolved solids. And it's as simple as that, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it doesn't really tell you a whole lot to be honest with you it tells you the total number of dissolved solids in your water and by dissolved solids I don't mean um, silt or sand or suspended solids I mean dissolved solids that are actually dissolved in solution in the water it's it's a measurement of the number of free ions that are in your water that are not water ions so they could be anything you could have sugar dissolved in your water you could have um you know sulfur dioxide dissolved into your water uh, you could have almost anything dissolved into your water and all of that would count as total dissolved solids so you've got this number let's just say you've got 300 parts per million total dissolved solids all that tells you is that you have 300 non-water ions in your water for every million water ions you have um, or water molecules you have so now you need to start picking away at finding out what those ions actually are are they copper is it calcium is it sodium is it magnesium I mean it could be anything um, if you store your water in um, something that water dissolves, you know, if you store your water in, say, an earthenware uh, container, what that container is made out of is slowly dissolving into your water, and that's going to affect the TDS number. So, when we start thinking about measuring our TDS to find out what's going on in our tank, too many times I've seen that number alone relied on as, okay, now you've got this number, let's start making decisions about what we're going to do to our tank. Um, if you look on your city or county municipal water supply, they will t generally tell you, or if you look at these sort of guidelines, um, they'll give you this really vague sort of like 100 to 150 parts per million is very soft water and you know 150 to 200 is moderately soft and and they give you all these numbers and they say you know anything over 500 parts per million is considered very hard and unsafe to drink and 
if you don't really understand what's going on with that statement, I can understand how you would take that as very definitive, but it's not. It's a, it's, a, it's a safe statement. It's a statement that they can make to say, okay, well, if those numbers are what we're talking about, if it was bad stuff, then that would be a lot of it. So let's just say that number. But you can have 500 parts per million dissolved stuff in your water that's completely harmless and does not affect the water's hardness at all, and yet you've still got them in your water. Now, like I said, this is going to get really complicated. I've got a lot of parts per million dissolved solids in my water. I'm not going to get into actual numbers right now, but a lot of those parts per million are sodium. And the reason they're sodium is because I put them there. I know it's sodium because I put them in there with my water softening system. I'm actually pulling ions out through an ion exchange resin. And what is exchanging for the ions I'm pulling out is sodium ions. That's what I'm putting back in. So in my case, I actually have a few things I can work with to begin understanding what that total dissolved solid number represents. Um, I can look at my source water coming out of the ground and I can measure the number of total dissolved solids in that. I can then measure the number of total dissolved solids in my tap water and I can do some calculations. I know what the exchange rate is. It gives me a rough idea of what I'm pulling out. It gives me a rough idea of what I'm putting back in. And since I know what I'm putting back in, uh, it gives me a pretty good idea of what's what with that TDS number. I also uh, am able to check my before and after pH because pH is affected by your total dissolved solids depending on what those dissolved solids are. Again, this is going to get a little confusing, but some ions dissolved in your water, some very common ions dissolved into your water would be calcium and magnesium, and both of these account for water hardness and keep pH buffered at a fairly high level. They're, they're very uh, alkaline buffers. So in those cases, if, that, if, you know, if you say, oh, I've got 300 parts per million in total dissolved solids and it was calcium and magnesium, then you could say, yeah, you've got pretty hard water and you'd probably have a pH of about 8.2 coming right out of the ground. Um, and those would be known quantities and you could sort of correlate them together. You could look at the TDS number, you could look at your pH, you could do a water hardness test, and you could put all that information together and deduce what number is what. You know, I've got this many calcium and I've got that many other things and so on and so forth. So without real serious scientific testing equipment, your TDS number really is only giving you sort of something to start with. That's giving you like a basic number of, all right, you've got this much something in your water. Now we have to go about figuring out what those somethings are. So there's different ways to do it, like I said, and it gets really complicated and confusing because some things affect pH and some things don't. Some things affect water hardness and other things don't. Uh, I actually have a very high number. If you just looked at the number of parts per million, you'd say I have pretty damn hard water. When you actually do a water hardness test, you'll find out, holy crap, I have zero hardness in my water, or sometimes it fluctuates all the way up to almost one degree of hardness. I have very, very soft water, yet I've got a lot of dissolved solids in it. And that's mainly because I got a lot of sodium in it. Now, I also am right on that borderline of not too much sodium, and it makes my water very versatile but very odd and there's some fish that simply cannot live in it uh, there's some fish that I can live uh, keep in it if they were captive bred but I cannot keep their wild caught cousins uh, it's just because I have too high of a TDS number now I'm going to further confuse it and believe me I haven't even begun to get it completely confusing yet because it all ties together and it all is dependent on this how that affects that and what your pH is and how stable that is under these conditions and it gets really confusing but in my water, with my sodium, sodium does not buffer, I mean, sodium buffers pH up, and it holds it at a much higher pH, but it does not account for hardness. So you can put all the sodium in your water you want, and it will not make your water any harder. Um, and when I say sodium, uh, generally the way you would put sodium in your tank would be just by putting aquarium salt, and that is sodium chloride, not 
marine salt, marine salts, I should say, because that is a whole chemical stew of different um, salts that you're, you're uh, dissolving into your water to make marine water. Aquarium salt is simply sodium chloride. So when that dissolves into your water, you are increasing your parts per million of total dissolved solids. Some of them are going to be sodium, some of them are going to be chloride. Um, that is not going to raise the hardness of your water. Sodium does not affect the hardness level. But it will buffer your pH up. You'll, if you have um, a fairly stable neutral pH and then you start adding aquarium salt, you may notice that suddenly you've got a 7.3 pH and you're wondering what in the world's going on here. Um, it's the sodium that's doing it. Um, you, you, you can just dig forever and, and keep learning about how everything affects everything in your water. Uh, that's why I do so many videos about water chemistry. It's absolutely fascinating to me. And you can just learn about it forever. Now, I have water that's very unique, I'll say, and it's probably not very unique. Uh, what's probably unique is my level of knowledge about my water. More people than realize probably have water very similar to mine if you have a water softening system. Now, I will say... Um, I usually say this early on, and I should have said this probably in the beginning. If you do have a water softener and you're not really sure what's going on with it, don't use that water in your aquarium. If you have very hard water and you're taking a lot of stuff out of your water, you're putting a lot of sodium back in. One of the reasons I can use my water is because I, it's not very hard to begin with coming out of the ground, so I'm not pulling a lot of stuff out. Since I'm not pulling a lot of stuff out, I'm not putting a lot of stuff back in. And with sodium ions, you can get, uh, even the most sensitive of fish can survive up to about 250 parts per million of sodium. So I've got somewhere in the neighborhood of 300 to 350 parts per million sodium in my water. And, I, you know, there's a few fish that I probably would not be able to keep no matter what I did. Um... Discus would be a good example and not because of the nitrates in my water. Discus wouldn't live in my water simply because I have well over 300 parts per million total dissolved solids. And that affects osmoregulation in fish. So once again, another layer of complexity. And it also, the reason I'm able to keep so many fish in my water is because the sodium ions actually help fish with osmoregulation under certain circumstances. So when I have fish that are slightly harder water fish than are able to go in my zero hardness water, the reason they can do that is because I'm providing them with the extra sodium ions that allow them to live in my water. Um, are you confused enough yet? Have I got this complicated enough? Because <laughs> I can keep going. I can make it more and more and more complicated because everything just ties into everything. We could start talking about what happens with your carbonate hardness as the lights go out at night and your plants stop photosynthesizing and your oxygen to CO2 levels begin to change. Now, I don't have tanks that um, are acidic enough to be unstable where I get that kind of fluctuation. I have fairly stable water because of all the, the, the uh, sodium ions in there. That's a pretty good buffer. Um, so I don't really over undergo a, a massive pH shift at night or anything like that, but you can. And the water you pour out of your tap, if you check the pH and then you let it sit in a bucket overnight and you check the pH again, it's very likely that your pH might be different because dissolved um, carbon in the form of CO2 is carbonic acid and when you have a lot of acid in the water it lowers your pH so as the bucket sits overnight and the water degasses you actually lose all this carbonic acid as it comes out of the water and your pH slowly rises and you might find out that you know you've been checking your tap water and you've got this neutral pH or you've got this 6.8 pH or something and then you check your tank four or five days later and you find out suddenly that you actually have 7.6 pH or something like that and if you've ever been puzzled as to why in the world your pH goes up after you've put it in your tank try doing that one time try putting it in a bucket letting it sit overnight put an air stone in it you know or a circulating pump and move it around like it would be in your tank and then check the pH 24 hours later and if it's different now you understand a little bit more about what's going on in your tank it's the uh, dissolved carbon that's coming out of your water and that all counts for total dissolved solids 
So this, like I said, is just kind of going to be the opening volley to really, you know, gear you up for whether you even want to waste your time trying to follow along with all of these uh, bouncing balls that are going to be going in every different direction, but all tie together and all interact with and affect each other. So lots of fun stuff if you like, uh, you know, sort of the nerd aspect of keeping fish and learning about what's happening with the water and all the science behind it, because that's what fascinates me. Uh, behind it. Uh, the first time I heard the words nitrogen cycle and looked that up, I, I was in love with fish keeping. I it just it opened the door to a whole entire world that worked within itself. It just it was amazing and fascinating and I have not stopped yet. So that will be our opening volley. Uh, we, please feel free to leave any questions, comments. Uh, if there's anything that you feel you don't fully understand and want me to go into more detail, uh, let me know. Again, as this video series continues, we'll be going into lots and lots of different aspects of total dissolved solids. I want to get my water uh, looked at more officially uh, so we can start putting those numbers together and finding out what they all mean and why my water is the way it is. I've still got my water system video in the works that I'm going to put together and that'll all tie into how my water works and what all the dissolved solids are and where they come from and why they're in there, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I, like I say all the time, I've got really, really complicated water, and it's, uh, it's very unusual water. So, please feel free to comment. Thanks for watching this. If you haven't subscribed, go ahead and do it. Don't want to miss any of these updates. All right, I'll see you, everybody.